and I am David Fridley. I, um, I'm currently working at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory in our uh, Environmental Energy Technologies Division, uh, which is primarily focused on end-use energy efficiency uh, and end-use uh, end efficiency technology. Um, I spent many years in the oil industry prior to coming to the Berkeley Lab, so uh, it was that congruence of seeing the limitations of what efficiency can, can do from the lab side and understanding in a very deep way the challenges we have on the oil side uh, that really got me deeply involved in, in the work on, on peak oil in San Francisco. Uh, and have been a member of San Francisco Oil Awareness now for, for I don't know, almost two years. Um, some of the work that we did there, Dennis and I worked on a group <coughs> that went to the uh, supervisors in San Francisco and got them to pass uh, a peak oil resolution last year. That was the first one that a major city had passed in the U.S. Um, the wheels of bureaucracy there do turn slow. I'm afraid they haven't made the same progress as a, as a place like uh, Portland. But tonight, I'm really glad to see you come out uh, because my own what has really led me to put this presentation together and to talk on this subject is is this growing concern that the public dialogue that we're having about biofuels in this country, particularly what you see in the media, in the newspapers, is, is biased, it's incomplete, and it's full of a great deal of inaccuracies. And so tonight, I'd really like to focus just in three areas, which is the energy science around biofuels, the environmental science around biofuels, and the ecological science around biofuels. Um, what I won't be doing tonight is trying to offer a prescription and alternatives and so forth. What I really would like to offer you is a series of, I, I would say, pretty solid facts that you can take with you in your own deliberations and discussions about biofuels with, with colleagues, families, or, or, or so forth. Um, and so let's start with it. These, the, these are the statements I find most often offered to us as what biofuels will provide us. Um, that a large scale uh, biofuel production industry is sustainable and green. That it's environmentally friendly, it'll help uh, combat climate change, reduce CO2 emissions. That it's critical to the US achieving energy independence. That it's good for the farmers. Uh, good for the land, that, that the second generation biofuels are going to save us, uh, and on and on and on. And so basically tonight I'm gonna to touch on elements of all of these, and so in the end we can come back to them and, and kind of sum this up. So the, at first, what, you know, what is a biofuel? Uh, all of us have used biofuels. If you've ever burned wood in a, in a fireplace, you've used biofuels. Um, it's what humans have survived upon since humans existed. Uh, today in the world, most common, you find the solid and the gas stuff, the uh, 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 methane digesters in China, for example. But what's really new is trying to take this uh, previously living matter and turning it to a liquid as a substitute for a fossil fuel. And so why are we doing this? Um, in the US in particular, you can see here uh, this is looking at how do we use oil in this country um, by different sectors in transportation, residential, industrial, and electric generation. And what stands out is our overwhelming dependence on uh, oil for transportation. Uh, nearly all of our diesel production, all of our jet fuel, of course, nearly all of our motor gasoline is all the liquid fuels we use for, for transportation. 95% of <clears throat> the transport energy in the U.S. is a liquid fuel from petroleum. And so some people come to biofuels from, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, I I've come to find out. Uh, some people are concerned about the environment and they really think biofuels are more environmentally friendly than petroleum. Some people come because they want to screw big oil. If you're not buying it from Exxon, you can buy it from your local biodiesel dealer. Um, other people come from it, as do I, and I think ultimately everyone will be, uh, from this stark fact that geologically we're quickly approaching the period globally in which oil production will no longer be able to rise. And once it hits that point, 
Uh, it may you know, stabilize for some period of time, but it inevitably will decline. And that decline is going to create a liquid fuels crisis uh, of a magnitude that we've never witnessed before. And indeed, we're already seeing it. I mean, this lower area here is conventional crude oil. Conventional crude oil has already peaked. It peaked in about uh, May 2005. And so all of the oil production increase that we've had since then has either been from tar sands, the black stuff, or this ultra deep water non-conventional crude such as off of Angola, uh, as well as a small batter, a smattering of biofuels. The rest has been demand destruction. Um, you know, in this country, we see reports where people are amazed that at four, $3 a gallon, people aren't driving less. But if you read reports from uh, countries like Ghana or Senegal, the price of oil has definitely uh, thrown people off that demand curve. So how, how are biofuels different from oil? Um, there's one very important characteristic, and I'll return to it again and again. Biofuels do not have the energy density of petroleum. Um, for example, biodiesel has one-fifth less energy than um, petroleum diesel, and ethanol has about half uh, the energy density of gasoline on a weight basis. And so you can see here, diesel is like 48 megajoules a kilogram. And so what, what does that mean in a everyday term? Um, uh, a kilogram of diesel is about two and a half pints. So it's about that much in liquid form. Um, a person every day needs between nine and 10 megajoules, that's about 2,000 to 2,500 calories to live. So two and, two and a half pints of diesel contains enough energy uh, to keep you know, a person alive for five days. Now, if you contrast that with imagining the volume of food that it would, you eat over five days, and you get a sense how this dense little liquid uh, why it's so powerful, because it contains so much energy in such a small f space. So the big thing in the U.S. is ethanol. So let's talk about ethanol a bit. And there's two major kinds of ethanol, uh, or processes to produce ethanol. One is the starch and sugar route through corn, mainly in this country, but also any starchy uh, plant. Or uh, in Brazil, in tropical areas, we have sugar cane. And then the second, the so-called second generation, is this cellulosic ethanol, which is basically any plant material. So, you know, ethanol production is not, um, well, as I like to say, it's not your grandpa's backyard still. It's a huge, large-scale, capital-intensive, energy-intensive industrial process uh, that uses a great deal of sophisticated technology. And so just quickly walking through this, you'll start to get a sense of the requirements it takes to actually turn corn into a liquid. You have to bring the corn in. You have to use energy to grind it up. You have to cook it at 300 degrees to turn it into a slurry. And then you have to add these enzymes that go in and turn the starches into to sugars. And then the sugar has to be fermented for two days and turned into a 10% alcohol beer. Uh, I mean, that's what ethanol is. It's, it's alcohol. Um, but what we need in our cars, we can't use a 10% alcohol beer. We have to have 99.8% pure ethanol. So, so we have to distill it, uh, just like you're producing vodka. And that means... <clears throat> Uh, and that can raise it up to 95% pure, but that's still not good enough because our internal combustion engines would seize up if we used it. So then we have to go through another phase called dehydration.